Any questions that came up during lunch? Everybody satisfied with full belly? Yeah, no bad. I'm not bad. So we'll 30, more more seconds, 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. I'll have a few seconds. Um, <laughs> let the state fair start its next vote. Two weeks from today, actually. So today is the last day to get early bird tickets. So $8 to get you in the door, pay for your parking, um, free concerts. So uh, August 19th to 29th, it's the uh, second state fair. You want to get your tickets today. See it price the door is 12 this year, so it's still pretty cheap, so get a chance. And let us know if you're coming up, we'll have to post it. Any other questions that came up during the month? Out of that plant, the corn comes in, and we get water out of 
of the out of the lake that are beside it, and they recycle the water, and then the, the, the byproducts of that process, you know, we're producing ethanol goes straight to get right to the tank. CO2 comes off that extraction, and we've got a CO2 plant sitting there on the yard, so all that CO2 goes into uh, dry ice production, and then the uh, byproducts of uh, the rest of the process go to the poultry and livestock industry here locally. So any kernel of corn that comes in there, it stays there, nothing wasted. Has to has to go to discard. It's all integrated into the egg sucker. Yeah, co-product, not byproduct. Co co-product. <laughs> we're we're, we're yeah, the whole right. buffalo. <laughs> well, along with that, last right year, I know they had an issue. Uh, with everybody was looking for hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. and so uh, a few of the local distilleries there, the ethanol plant, uh, decided they had lots of alcohol, and they'd already gone through the process of it being purified enough for. Uh, human use and food use. Uh, so they work with Owensboro grain, getting the glycerin, one of the required ingredients, and uh, they started manufacturing uh, thousands of gallons of uh, hand sanitizer that was shipped throughout Kentucky and around the world. At this time, Michaela Hiller here, we come up. Uh, sorry for the little technical glitch there. I appreciate uh, Shelly getting us through that and uh, for your presentation. Kentucky. 
We market all of our calves through either CPH or Hereford certified preconditioned sales, and we have developed and marketed crossbred heifers through the best of the best heifer sale. Um, with the help of Ben Lloyd, our area director for the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. We have also developed purebred <laughs> bulls for local commercial cattlemen. Overall, my 4-H and FFA experience has enabled me to prepare a career in, for a career in agriculture. I will be entering in WKU this fall to major in agriculture education so that I can continue passing on my love for agriculture to another generation. We live in a time where our culture is being farther and further removed from the farm. I believe organizations like 4-H and FFA are the keys to advocating for the industry that is not only important but vital to our future survival. Thank you again for having me this morning.
just got to go to with my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I worked with uh, Brian's dad at the Burley Co-op for a long time, and, and it was always my hope, my dream, that, that maybe we could vert- vertically integrate there. And, and Roger got some of that done for a while and, and didn't work out, but uh, try to be in the retail market with an agricultural product from, from beginning to end. And uh, we are fortunate that, that we've had, we have that, maybe the only one in the state that uh, is on the farm where the cattle are produced, where they're fed, where they're raised, and, and where they're harvested. Uh, I could get up here and spend the whole time thanking people because uh, this wouldn't have been possible without without a lot of people in this room. Uh, first of all, Ryan to have the idea to, to, to sell the, the need for uh, meat to be produced locally and sourced locally and harvested locally uh, for uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ag Development Fund. Uh, Dorsey was here earlier. Is he still here? Dorsey really was involved. Now Brian. Uh, Brian's been out to the plant and enjoyed their visit. He and Bill came out there and, and uh, it just made us, I, I don't know that, it, that we wouldn't have done it without that, but I can promise you that we wouldn't be at the level of operation that we are at the Ag Development Fund's not been there. Uh, it's been a, a real shot in the arm to get high class uh, Equipment and be able to uh, uh, process uh, with uh, with first class equipment. Uh, I'd be most of if any of you are involved in in the slaughter business, you know about Yoder's down here at Seabury, and uh, you know they could have said we don't want any competition, we don't want anybody coming in here, and uh, we'd like to put a stop to that. But instead of that, Jerry. Uh, the older the older family has uh, really been uh, essential to me and advising me and telling me uh, what we should do, what opportunities we should take advantage of, and to the point that uh, when we got the equipment in, that by the way was the same equipment they were using because I saw how well it worked. Uh, they came over one day and uh, uh, helped us set up that equipment and make sure that it was running right. You know, that's what's so great about agriculture, is that we all are concerned about each other. I was talking to Mr. Todd from Hometown Roots. He made that reference that Tim talked about, and, and he's very interested in being able to source uh, some more of his uh, uh, produce or uh, meat or whatever he can locally. And so it's just it's just hand in glove. And it's been a real opportunity for us. Uh, it's been a, been a learning curve. I told somebody this morning, learning curves like this, I've just tried to keep it from coming back over the phone top. Uh, when we started this business, uh, when, when Lois would cook a steak, Brian, I knew how to cut it up. And that was the extent of our knowledge. So uh, it's, it's been, a, been a great opportunity and, and wouldn't have happened uh, had, had it not been for the visionaries in the state, including Brian and Brian and Tim and others that, that have been involved with that. We got total support from from the lending industry, from Farm Credit, who's here, from uh, Wayne Mattingly, my banker back there in, in the back, and and it's just been a, a great, great uh, uh, opportunity for us to do that vertical integration and cut out that guy with the beard. So uh, we are processing about uh, 15 cattle a week and about 12 to 15 hogs, and. Uh, as I say, it's on our operation, and that means a lot to me. And I've got two sons. Uh, one of them, Brandon, got the grain crop dumped in his lap this year. He, whether he was ready or not, he had it. Uh, we opened March 14th, I think, and I've been gone five days. Uh, this is the sixth one uh, from from the plant down there, and, and so he got that dumped in his lap. And uh, my younger son is very interested in, in the uh, beef and bacon. He's working there and doing that. And, and uh, I see, see Suzanne back there, certainly don't want to overlook thanking them because without uh, uh, their support through the years and getting those dollars that came from tobacco back to tobacco farmers, we had never been able to do it either. Uh, just a great opportunity and, and uh, we appreciate the support. Uh, uh, local farmers that have supported us. And you know, one of the reasons, and I, I see Curtis back there too, I don't want to forget Curtis because 
We did this in McLean County. If I tried to do this in Davis County, I wouldn't be through the red tape yet. <laughs> and uh, it seems like <clears throat> in Davis County, uh, they say, uh, here's why you can't do this. And as soon as I bought beef and bacon, I got a call from Curtis Jamie. He said, look, I want you to know whatever we can do for you locally here, we want to do. And uh, it's, it's probably coming from Curtis coming from the ag uh, sector because that same cooperation camaraderie uh, exists across that. So thank you, Curtis, on that. But you know, uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to do that, every animal, every cow or every beef that's run through there increases the value to that farmer by three to four hundred dollars for him to direct market that quarter, that half, whatever he can sell like that. And we, so far we've run about 400 head through there. And if you can figure that, most of that, about 80 percent of that is other farmers other than myself. And so that has been a stimulus, I think, and an opportunity for us to uh, to get return some of that vertical integration back to the farm. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody that's been involved, Brian, and everybody that's helped us do that. It's, uh, it's been a great experience. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Our next speaker comes to us from the farmer at Frenchman Winery. And I uh, was down a couple weeks ago and had the opportunity to drive past their place and uh, very picturesque and uh, we'll learn a little bit about agritourism and uh, the wine business. Dr. Katie. All right, well thank you for asking us to present. I'm going to be doing the first part and then Uber will come and answer some questions. Oh, he's safe, shaking his head. <laughs> um, so I wanted to present today um, about our experience at Farmer and Frenchman, and especially um, how that as an agritourism project has changed uh, post-2020 landscape. So that's my way of saying, you can't really say post-COVID yet, but we can say post-2020. <laughs> so, um, so a little bit about our business first. Um, farmer and Frenchman, that represents me, farmer, I'm the farmer. And then the Frenchman, of course, is the authentic Frenchman, Hubert, who is from Paris, France. Um, so together, we, um, we found this uh, historic tobacco barn on my great-grandfather's land. And um, we have a picture here. This was before we renovated everything. Um, but there wasn't anything else here until 2015, and that's whenever we planted the vineyard. So we started planting that in 2015, and then you see we were ready to harvest by August of 2019. So we really saw um, Henderson as being a prime location for our project, because not just because of the beautiful scenery, but also because we have the perfect clientele for it. So we have the um, locals who are wanting to, who are comfortable like in the uh, farm experience, but we're also about two hours away from bigger metropolitan areas, and they're really excited about coming and having like this authentic farm experience too. So um, a little bit more about us. We bottle about 20,000 bottles a year. Um, some of the grapes are coming from our vineyard but we are needing a lot more grapes. So that's room for big growth here. Is, uh, and I'll get into more exactly how many pounds of grapes that's, that's, gonna, look, that's gonna look like. Um, we are also a cafe. Um, the core of our brand is that we feature local products um, and products that have like a story behind it. So whenever we are serving our customers, they're really excited to hear not just about the way that the dish was made with the French or Italian finesse, but where that vegetable came from um, and what's the story behind it. Consumers are really interested in the story building behind the products that they're consuming. Um, we are also an event venue. So this is the interior of that barn that I showed in the first picture. Um, and it's really romantic to have a wedding on a vineyard. So 
Um, we do have about 50 events, no, I'd say, well, 30 events per year that are about 100 to 200 people, and then we have about 20 events that are 50 people or less. Um, we also have three guest cabins, overnight cabins on location, um, so guests can experience that full <coughs> tourism experience. They can walk along the 70 acres of um, the farmland, they can take in the view, the private view of the vineyard, and they can hang out with us in the cafe. So these cabins are also on brand because they are solar powered and energy efficient. And we're, I have a, a so raised beds going here, that's on the other side of the, um, of the restaurant. Um, so you see in the spring it looks really good and orderly and I have great plans for how it's going to turn out and then that's what it looks like in the summertime. So that's what it looks like right now. Um, so we are able, I mean there's some weeks where we're able to get all the vegetables that we need out of our garden, but that only represents a few weeks per year. Um, we also get a lot of our produce from Kate's Farm and also from the Henderson Farmers Market. So we also have a little hen condo here. Uh, we do have hens that provide us with eggs. Um, and that also kind of plays into the experience of the cabin guests. A lot of them have never even been in a rural setting before. So to interact with a hen for them is like a really big deal. <laughs> so now we're getting into some of the actual pounds of produce that we need per week. So I created this to show you all the different products that we use, how many pounds per week we're using, and about how many weeks per year we're able to supply this either in-house or from somebody in the county. And then the asterisks represent um, a year-round uh, or a, a hydroponic grower, and we're able to get those things year-round. But we would really like to get more of our pounds and more of our weeks uh, coming from Henderson County producers. That would be really exciting. Or in the region. We'll settle for region. <laughs> All right, next we're going to talk about meat and dairy demand, beef and bacon. <laughs> so so we, um, we'd like to source 100% locally, but in a good year we're looking at about 50% of our beef steaks being local. So our, our biggest challenge right at this moment is the USDA processing availability, but we're really excited about your project so we can get back with some more beef and bacon products. Um, and now this is probably our biggest demand is grapes. So we use about 10 tons of grapes per year. Our estate vineyard produces 4,700 pounds. And we also have another um, vineyard that we source from. It's David Hatchett out in Wolf Hills. He provides us with about 5,000 pounds, but we still have 10,300 pounds left over that we need. So we would really like to start sourcing more of those within Kentucky. So that's a big, big room for growth for Kentucky vineyards. Um, we're also able to get some seasonal fruit in our cafe, and those are all 100% um, local, but that's just available uh, spring through fall. So um, what does all this have to do with that post-2020 consumer landscape? Um, since opening in 2016, we've seen a huge increase, especially during 2020, of um, people, urban travelers, wanting to come out to our space. The reason for that is because urban travelers couldn't um, go to the normal urban epicenters for travel, so they were looking at more farm stays, agritourism, that type of stuff. It's just easier logistically to social distance in the rural setting, so people got a taste of what the wide open space is really like. Um, they're also looking for outdoor activities and outdoor venues instead of being in cities and instead of being um, an indoor venue. Um, and then I think most interestingly, um, gardening, cooking, slow food, this all really increased interest and this really increased after the COVID confinement because people were at home, they were cooking, they were starting to learn more about different types of vegetables and products that they could use. So I see the trend now being that local products are championed even more. Um, they're even more on trend and I think that 
we really have a, I mean, Kentucky is ahead of the game on this because we have a lot of local producers, we have a lot of knowledge on how to create some artisanal products, and consumers just love that backstory about it. So, um, especially for us, but other, um, other types of businesses in our sector are going to all be interested in getting some more small farm produced products like this. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about, uh, before I wrap up here, all of the organizations that helped us make our project possible. So I just put it in order of, the, of how we reached out to people. So first, I'm an academic by trade. Not anymore, I guess I'm not really an academic anymore, but I said, okay, we're going to go to the college and ask them what to do. So uh, Patsy Wilson there is the resident viticulturalist. And she helped us every step of the way. I mean, she still comes out now. She was just there a couple weeks ago checking everything out and telling us what we were doing right and wrong. <laughs> um, our Henderson County Ag Extension, wow, you guys are great, really. Um, Andy Wright out and Mike Smith, anytime I come with them with a new idea, they're like, all right, let's scale it back a little bit. <laughs> Watch this season. They'll, give me, they'll give me all the resources that I need help me research stuff, and that's, that, they're a great resource for us. Um, the Henderson Chamber of Commerce helped us with our business plan, and then also our, um, just helping us do our feasibility study, like if this would even really work in Henderson. And, and then of course, uh, Kentucky Proud is a great service. Uh, we use this all the time, especially for the restaurant incentives that we get for buying from Kentucky Proud producers. Um, and thank you for all the branding support and outreach that you do for Kentucky Proud products. And so, I will, oops, I'll wrap that one up. But I do wanna let us, I seem like I'm in the right crowd here. We are looking for a trailer and a tractor, so. <laughs> we need to buy one like in the next two weeks. So, um, hopefully we can get in touch with some people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Start as an independent producer today 
and make it. Now, you could be a contractor or there's quite a bit of that going on. Most of everybody is familiar with the way the chicken business is. There are opportunities in contract growing, but you just have to sell up with somebody uh, that's already in it bigger and, and needs and want to use contract growers. Um, okay, back to telling the story. Um, you know, all industry creates noise, dust, and odor. Uh, we need to know that agriculture is probably really better than almost any other industry at doing all three. But we, we need to kind of tell our story as what our value is so we don't seem to be quite such a nuisance. About three years ago, we used a company called PIC. It's the largest radio stock company in the, in the world. We think they're the best. Uh, they came to us, like I said, about three years ago, and they said, you know, the livestock industry is under such scrutiny, and, and uh, we need to tell our story. And so this piece of paper that I think everyone had put in front of them at your desk is something that they put together for us to kind of tell our story, who we are, and what contribution we're making to the, to the economy, you know, the city, state, county, uh, and, the, and the, you know, the whole United States. Um, anyway, of course, I enhanced it just a little bit. It's probably a little bigger than they did three years ago. Um, I don't know that I need to go over all these numbers. Uh, it's just a little bit boring, but you know, we, we make significant charitable contributions. I think one of the biggest things we do for our county is that we buy a lot of corn, about two and a half million bushel of corn. We're paying farmers premiums for their corn because we're just a little bit off the beaten path and we want to attract farmers to come down to us. I couldn't find, figure out how to prove or disprove if, whether our demand for this additional corn actually increases the county price. But if it did actually increase the penny, it'd be another $400,000. Is too big to be eight hundred thousand. So I don't know what that number is. It may not, may not be anymore. Uh, this probably tells the whole story that we bring in about fifty million a year into the, into our uh, our county, um, and that just about all goes out because we don't haven't made any money in the last six years. So. <laughs> <laughs> we are having a good year this year, and hopefully a few more to get kind of caught up here. Um, you know, we pay out uh, property taxes of ninety-four thousand dollars a year, and about sixty percent or sixty-two thousand of that's going into the schools. The rest of it's going into fire departments and other public services. Um, we pay out over forty thousand in vehicle taxes that's used to fund Owensboro downtown restoration, which I was pretty adamantly against, but I do like it there. I take my kids to play at Smokers Park pretty regular. It's a nice place. Um, we employ, this is another thing that I really like too that we do is we, we, we uh, created 120 jobs. Paying out $5.2 million in wages and 342000 in payroll taxes. Uh, using the, the use of, uh, of our uh, manures, organic nutrients, about $323,000 worth a year to turn back into the soil. We sell some of this. Uh, also, um, it's probably double that value this year for the last price. It's going out the roof. Um, anyway, in talking to this crowd here, I feel like I'm kind of, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because I think most of the people, everyone in this room does know and understand and appreciate agriculture. And, and uh, but, but even y'all needed to see, and I'm not specific in this, there's a lot of people doing things bigger and better than this in the state. But agriculture is, is, uh, is certainly very important to, to uh, our state and to the nation. Um, you know, we're one generation. I think, I think I'm the last generation where almost everyone had a connection to the farm. I mean, all the people that are on the farm still had a connection to the farm. Through a grandfather, a father, an aunt, or uncle, or cousin, or somebody. I believe that's all gone. So does that mean, or I think that means, that we're going to have to try to educate the public? But I'm a little bit, and I'm kind of getting off uh, what I really should be talking about here today, but I've gotten kind of pretty interested in politics. And so I think I need to say this, but I've got a group here that, that I think are pretty influential people. 
it sounds good to educate the public, but I will tell you that most of the public is not interested in our story. Uh, almost all, you know, they, they just don't know anything about politics and are not going to learn. So I think what we have got to do, and I'm going to quote Rod Keeble today, he passed away three years ago, and I didn't know he said this until I read his eulogy, but he said, if you're not at the table, you might end up on the table. So we've got to get there, and I think the way we've got to get there is through our legislators, um, and we've got to have the right kind of people in the legislation. And uh, uh, our problem is that farmers are conservative, and most of them, all they think about is staying home and working and moving their own shit forward. They don't mind other people doing this just around. <laughs> and they're not, that has got to change. We have got to get active, we've got to get active in politics, and I'm, I'm the world's worst. I didn't until about five years ago, and I, and I thought too much about it. But, but we, we have got to get we have got to get politically involved. Um, we are very fortunate to have Ryan Quarles. He's a very exceptional person. Great in this body that, and hope that he goes further. And I think I don't know if you got those kind of ambitions, but if you do, we need to get behind him and find out, find other guys like him that basically they don't have to come to the farm, they don't have to have been passed to add commissioners, but they gotta have a good thought process. Um, let's see, you know, we're lucky we got James Comer in Washington already. That's great, that's wonderful. Um, I gotta say, you probably, you probably know, President Political Climate is probably a little bit anti-ag. Liberal environmentalists and animal welfare people are armed with uh, a lot of emotion, few facts, and uh, and pretty much devoid of life thought process, in my opinion. Uh, they will take our technology away from them if we don't fight back, and that's all they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Henderson, 
uh, even first industry requirement, we have a, a cafe, uh, but we want to use the, the product, the local product, even if I'm not doing a, a, a local cooking, it's more international cooking, but we want to be uh, a full experience. Be here and have a, and build like a French house. Uh, for me, was a, just we build uh, with another barn who looks like the original barn from Kentucky. So the ingredients that we want to use, we want to use it. Uh, we want to use the local. <coughs> that was actually on the last night. There, the quality of all their products. Uh, but we were talking last night about this issue about the amount of opportunity it is to feed the agritourism industry, but they need more uh, business people interested in uh, processing the meats, uh, growing the vegetables, the berries, the things that go right upon the table, and that we don't have enough right now. And I wonder how do we how do we tackle that issue? How do, how do we get people interested in doing that? Because it's obviously a different uh, uh, enterprise than full-blown uh, grain farming or you know, large-scale pig producers. But it is for agriculture. Any, anybody have any thoughts about how we can uh, get more younger folks or middle-aged folks interested in doing that? You know, when you do a study a little bit like Katie did, you give the number, this is our need. So you go all to a locally or uh, even you extend that uh, a little bit further, not two hours away, an hour away, uh, because you have always a distribution problem. But you say, okay, that was the need of all these uh, restaurants and others, you know, who uh, need uh, this product. Okay, that's it. You have the customer right here. Uh, sure, but we have to do that for them, like marketing services. That This is the, uh, the, the potential need uh, around you an hour away. You take it, you don't take it, but that the need, the need are here. Uh, so they buy it anywhere, they can't find it. Uh, but to, to do the job for uh, for these people, uh, I guess maybe somebody's going to say, ah, oh, as a big farm, maybe I'm going to do more of this because I have an opportunity to sell this amount of here for our needs. So you think existing farmers may want to, you know, diversify and get into that? Yes, because uh, if you don't diversify, I guess at one moment you can with the body, you have to be sure that uh, if uh, one day, uh, one year, uh, you cannot sell the uh, grain at this price, and maybe you have another product, you can be able to buy it. So it is not bad, it does at least uh, help uh, your income of uh, one year. Uh, if you uh, really stop with one product or two products, sometimes it might be hard. Uh, hard. That's why us, uh, when I opened, we didn't know how it's going to be the red pump to the wines. Uh, right away, people say, uh, okay, we want food. Okay, so okay, we need food. After people told me, ah, what are you going to do? A good steak. Okay, so we start the steak on the, on the board, you know, as a special. But also, uh, I was scared that uh, uh, maybe it would not be enough. So uh, we built another building to have an event center. Like you said, you can do an event and we can still sell in food and, uh, and wine. And after that, I say, uh, okay, we have some space where we live, so we're going to do better breakfast. Because if I don't have enough people coming, uh, into my restaurant, maybe I can do a little bit of income to survive, to, to pay my bill, uh, we do better breakfast. So we end up to have three cabins. But uh, I didn't want to uh, do it in a big scale, but I wanted to be sure to, uh, I wouldn't be able to pay my, uh, my, my, my bill at the end of the month and provide to my family. So, uh, so, it's, a me, uh, so it's an internal potential making of bringing new people to the table. What do you, what do you think about it? Thank you. Okay, what's your answer? <laughs> How many, uh, how many kids that are in FFA would like to have the opportunity to stay home on the farm? The chicken houses have done that. The poultry industry has done that some for us. You know, a lot of, a lot of young, young farmers uh, have been able to stay on the farm because they can have <coughs> that poultry. Same thing, and I was just thinking about what the farmer Christian was saying about vendors, the need for grapes that they have. And, and somebody, Michaela's age, that wants to go to Western and that, you said mm -hmm. wants to go to Western and, and maybe she takes a few studies about uh, grapes and, and she's able to convince uh, her family that that's something that they might do on five or six acres and start something like that. But, but the young people that want to stay on the farm, that's, that's where you introduce the opportunity. You know, 
old guys like Jerry and I, we don't like a lot of new ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all you have to do is look around the room, and, and that question is being addressed by a number of different individuals, service providers, agencies. Uh, Brian and his shop have uh, provided over $600 million <laughs> for ag development projects in Kentucky. And some of those have been educational, some of those have been experimental, some of them have been cost shared to do new practices. Uh, we've got several people from the extension office here that are involved in demonstration plots, uh, helping transfer knowledge from one farm to another. USDA in Washington is providing a lot of funding today uh, for these type of efforts. And so uh, those of us that have farmed uh, full time in the past uh, understand the challenges, uh, you know, weather, markets, pests, insects, uh, lots of other things that can be described and uh, make it frustrating some days. But, uh, you know, the perseverance and the work ethic and the ingenuity of the speakers that we've heard today make it really possible. I know, Commissioner, uh, let's make some closing remarks. One last question. Uh, I'll disagree with Rod. I'm curious, what is Jerry O'Brien's <coughs> next innovation? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 okay, let's get one more round of applause. Thank you all for your time today. Special thanks to uh, Bex for hosting us, our sponsors, and of course, our wonderful uh, two panels of speakers. It's been great to be down here. Uh, this is one of five land meetings this year. It gets really regional, so just think about how different this conversation is to be in which area of the state. Just to give you an example, you know, Eastern Kentucky, we talked a lot about timber and wood and wood products and crafts and Appalachia Proud type of stuff. And so over the past few years, we've actually been able to connect some of our manufacturers with agriculture uh, inputs and so we're, we're, we're all really are trying to uh, try to nibble away and trying to find an opportunity and and we can by the way we can source those grapes for you we know we know where we're at in Kentucky so it's so one thing we put on our to do list before we go out um, here's a few takeaways um, local is real and COVID only uh, brought to the top something that we already knew was bubbling and we're hoping that it's not a fad of 2020 that's hoping something's real. Uh, our, this didn't come up today. One thing we're trying to do is get the school systems in each county to make a commitment to buy local. And, and local school system is the biggest buyer of food in every county in Kentucky, whether it's Robertson County with less than 3,000 people or Jefferson County or even right here. They're the biggest buyer of food. So imagine what a 1, 2, or 3% commitment by the school system to buy local could do for a new business uh, or diversity. Uh, another thing we're doing is that we're trying to systematically address existing industries in our state and asking them to substitute their inputs with, with stuff coming off Kentucky farms. And there's no better example than, than the bourbon industry. Five years ago, less than 40% of the corn used in Kentucky bourbon came from Kentucky farms. And we said we have a problem here. And it's an image problem, really. And the uh, past four years, we're, we're around 60 to 65% of that corn is coming from our farmers. We want to get a get up to 100 percent. So that's another example of what our staff's been doing over the last few years as well. We have this. It's very powerful. I think in Kentucky, we've had 20 good years at Kentucky Proud. Other states are just now catching up. And so for a lot of us, they're using that symbol. By the way, we have 10,700 Kentucky Proud members at this point. That is often the entry point for a small business to get off, get up off the ground, whether it's an FFA, SAE, or a uh, or a couple or an individual that makes that decision, it's time for me to quit my day job and do this full time because it's going to be more fun and more profitable. So that's something we have that other states really don't have. Another takeaway is that is agriculture and manufacturing in Kentucky, it's big and it's small. There's a lot of diversity here. I think Brian, at last count, we had somewhere between four, about 400 different types of crops and livestock commodities being attempted to be grown in Kentucky, including chia, indigo all the other stuff. And so there's a lot of diversity here that Kentucky and other states don't have as well. We have rich soils, we all have timber, and we have water. And I think that's something that we're gonna have a big conversation on in the coming years. Uh, last week I was with Joe Kane out in Colorado, it was on a farm 
that, that uh, had three and a half inches of rain this year since January 1st. And so that's something that, that in Kentucky, we get lots of it that's more of a management issue here and quality issue. I guess the discussion is not going away. Another thing is that um, because of COVID, I think we're going to reevaluate food systems in America. And I think that could be a positive thing for our state. Uh, try to capture some more of that integration. And, and I think local is starting to show that it can work. It's not a niche thing anymore. Another thing we're working on the national level is just protecting crop technology. Uh, this always surprises people. My office permits 16,000 16, products. And it's dominated in agriculture by maybe 100 of those are dominant chemicals and crop technology. And so whenever a new crop technology comes out, it's being tested, it's going to the court system, et cetera. It's on the national level, we're trying to make it easier for crop technology to be approved here. But more importantly, we want that research to be done in, in America and not in other countries as well. We want that to be done here. And increase the regulatory reform period for crop technology to be approved. Another thing that did not come up today is that the activists are not going away. Well, kind of did come up a little bit. They're not going away. And our best defense is just telling the truth, telling the positive side of our, of our industry. That's something we're going to do. We'll do it at the State Fair here in a couple weeks with a few hundred thousand people. And one last thing that I've got here is that, you know, the standards of our industry are oftentimes set by the consumers and not us. And that's something we just got to be mindful of. So stay engaged. We appreciate your all's participation here today. It means a lot to me. And I'll never think of a NASCAR race, a beer, <laughs> <laughs> the same way for the rest of my life. So thank you all so much for having us.